Well, g'day from Melbourne, everyone, and welcome to the Tim Topham TV podcast. This is episode 11, uh, and it is so good to have you with me. I'm really, really excited with the content that we've got today, and I'm also really excited about the sorts of things that uh, you guys have been saying online and in emails to me and the reviews that we've been getting on iTunes. Really, really good stuff. It, uh, it means a lot because, uh, obviously, a lot of time goes into it, and it's great to know that it's making change in people's studios. So thank you all for those kind comments. Uh, just before we get stuck into I wanted to mention that uh, a few people have been asking me at a conference that I was at recently, or well, they'd been saying, hey, Tim, love your podcast. It's really good, but I just don't have an hour to sit down in front of the computer and watch you on YouTube. And I said, you know what? I, I wouldn't have that time either very often. Uh, and that's why I stream this through or I connect it through iTunes. So really the way I consume podcasts, and this is a great source for my own kind of education, is when I'm sitting in the car stuck in traffic. And we're all in that kind of position a fair bit these days, unfortunately. So if you want to make the most productive use of that time, then grab out your smartphone, go to the iTunes iPod, uh, sorry, um, podcast player, and search for Tim Topham. And you can just listen to my episodes there. If you want to watch bits later on, you can always come back to YouTube when you want to, if there's something specific. But otherwise, yeah, make use of that time that you're stuck in the traffic or you're going for a walk. Someone said they're you know, at the gym on their bike, listening to it and getting excited. So uh, I, I think that's, that's great. That's the best way to do it. And that's why I've got the two versions going. Now, uh, really looking forward to introducing in a moment uh, Graham Fitch, who's my special guest today. And today's episode is all about helping you teach practicing better. Because we all know how frustrating it can be when we try our best to teach students how to practice something and they come back having done you know, all the things wrong that we didn't want. So the chat today is going to be all about practicing and how to teach it more effectively. Um, as usual, we've got a great download. Uh, Graham's put together a, uh, a practice tips download that you can share with your students. That's going to be on the show notes page. Um, and we're also going to be giving a discount away for Graham's ebooks. And these are fantastic. I've, I've regularly referenced them myself. They are really, really good, full of videos also. So all that information is going to be on the show notes page, timtopham.com forward slash episode 11. And if you'd like to leave a review uh, on iTunes, this, this would be so, so good. If you've got a spare five minutes or less, um, just head to timtopham.com forward slash iTunes and all the instructions are there. So without further ado, uh, I would love to introduce uh, Graham. Graham maintains an international reputation as a pianist, a teacher, an adjudicator and a writer. Um, he's a regular writer, in fact, for Pianist Magazine and has several demonstration videos on the magazine's YouTube channel. This guy knows his stuff when it comes to practicing. Um, he's recently published an ebook, which I just mentioned, based on his popular blog, which is practicingthepiano.com. And Graham teaches privately in London. Uh, and he's also a principal tutor on the Piano Teachers course, which is run by EPTA in the UK. Graham, good uh, morning over there. How are you going? Morning. Thank you, Tim. Good to be here. <laughs> now, I've probably covered a little bit about uh, what you do and that sort of thing. And I think most people, if, you're co if, if viewers are connected online, they're going to be familiar with your blog because you have a huge following online, and rightly so, too. It is fantastic content. But what's a day in the life like for you these days, uh, Graham? Do you spend most of your time teaching, or are you writing, or traveling? What are you doing? Well, it's all kind of related. <laughs> and it just, as I do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I mean, at the moment, I'm preparing a recital program which is coming up in, well I've already done two runs of, of this particular program, I've got two more to go, um, so that's an all Schumann program with the right. F sharp minor sonata, Papillon, and just to start off with a little bit of Couperin, because I do love uh, the French Baroque, mm. so I've got a little bit of that together. So at the moment today will be a busy practicing day, um, because it's the summer, a little bit less teaching than usual, but it could be uh, students from early in the morning until late afternoon. It could be sitting at my desk writing. Um, each day tends to be a little different, but it's, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Adjudication is another thing that I love to do. Mm -hmm. um, and also my work uh, uh, tutoring on the, the actor piano teacher's course. That's yeah. A, yeah. How often is that course run? Because there's very few courses like that out there. This, is, even though I have to say so uh, myself, it, it, it's a wonderful course. I think the thing is each of the principal tutors brings their own areas of specialization. And what happens, it's a year course, but it's, it's residential weekends or residential days throughout the year. And the, those 
days or weekends are uh, arranged in the holiday period. So, you know, it's if you've got a full teaching schedule, you can still, you know, attend this course. I mean, it works very, very well. Yeah. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll put a, have to put a link to that in the show notes page. So that's the uh, the piano teachers course run by Epta. I'll uh, I'll link to that so people can find out more about it. But let's get back on track. We want to talk about practicing, and you've had a blog. Uh, how many years have you been blogging at practicingthepiano.com? Oh, um, I think this must have been since 2011. I remember sitting in my kitchen one March uh, <laughs> March day in 2000, and thinking, "Hmm, I'd like to write a blog." <laughs> 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 Isn't that funny? People ask me how I got started and, and I, I just, I never really thought I'm going to start a blog. I just kind of wanted a way to share things, I guess. Um, why, why did you focus on practice as, as something that you wanted to blog about? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I had started, my very first teacher who I, who I had when I began all those years ago uh, was, was once uh, indisposed for a while. So she sent me to, for lessons with Philip Folk, who you may know. He's a wonderful British pianist, really. Amazing. Yeah, amazing pianist. <clears throat> and I did my grade eight with him, but before that I had a few lessons on other things. And I, I'll never forget those lessons. They were really uh, seminal for me. He would say, if I was struggling with something, I, I, I would say, I can't quite manage that that section there. Or I don't know what, what how to do the left-hand part there. He'd say, how do you practice it? And it wouldn't just be, he wouldn't be content with, oh, well, I, I do it every day. No, he'd say, how, how do you practice it? And, and he made me from that stage, my earliest years, think about how does one actually solve a problem mm. by oneself at the piano? Because if you think about it, a lesson is what, an hour a week? How many hours do we expect these, these students to practice between the lessons? Presumably, if they're serious, you know, tertiary level students, they'd be doing four hours a day. So that's... What's the, what's the proportion of lesson time to practice? They better know what they're doing. Absolutely, um, yeah. And I've, I've, I've often thought about it for, uh, you know, for, for people like me teaching predominantly high school students, we get 30 minutes. And uh, out of the week, I remember reading a calculation, you know, it is such a minuscule amount. And I guess that's why I'm so interested in talking about this because it's so crucial to our students' progress, isn't it? Absolutely. It, it, it can't be done. If you think about what practice is, it's training, isn't it? It's learning skills, it's developing habits, forming habits, so that the, the playing in the end just needs to be automated. Mm. What you do, I mean, what a, what a professional pianist does when we, when we go on stage is we press some button in our brain and out comes a particular piece. And our job is basically get, to get out of the way, isn't it? So we can allow the creative uh, flow to happen. As soon as we start doubting, you know, what's, what's my third finger supposed to be doing in that bar, we interfere with that, with that process. The process of laying it down happens in the practice room, and this is, this, is where, this is what needs to be taught, so that the teacher needs to be able to very, very, very precisely explain to the student how to use their practice time, and what are the differences between playing through something um, you know, there's this expression, practice makes perfect. I don't think it does. I think practice makes permanent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with that. 100%. Uh, and that's why it's just so important for, and I tell my students, I'm sure you do the same thing, just make sure you go slowly enough that you can get things right. Oh, that's one thing I do. I don't know if that's the right thing to do. But, uh, yeah, because it does make permanent very, very quickly. The brain is incredibly quick to learn the wrong things, isn't it? <laughs> the wrong things as well as the, the, the right things. And also, you know, I've, I've come to this recently that um, if the teacher is too negative, the student is going to be tense, and that tension gets built into the playing as well. That gets built in, in the practice room. Oh, I better make sure I do this for my lesson properly because my teacher's going to fly off the handle if I don't. And that physical, that physical locking, mental, whatever we're thinking when we practice, also shows up in the product. You know, so we have to be. Um, but I think very well. I just, if I may, sort of fast forward a little bit to my very last teacher, mm. Nina Svetlanova mm. in New York. Now, Nina was a student of Neuhaus, which really you don't get any better than that. I mean, we're talking about the, the elite, um, probably the elite piano teacher in the time, one of them anyway, of the 20th century. Mm, absolutely. Uh, mm, absolutely. Yeah, and he, she was a long, long time student of his. She would also ask the same question, and I'll never forget playing for her Chopin Scherzo number three. Oh, one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, there was, I came to a place, I forget which place it was now, but, but there was one part there that in, in the lesson didn't quite work. It may have been the coda. And she said, so, so how, are you, I won't try and do the Russian accent, but she said, how, so how are you practicing that? Exactly the same words as I had when I was, you know, a young teenager from Philip. How are you practicing that? Well, I came up with a list of um, eight things. It, it was never enough just to say, well, I'm doing it slowly. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, yes, of course, we're doing it slowly, but it was never enough for that. And so eight things, and she stopped me at the end and she said, yes, it's the fifth thing. That's what's stopping you. All the others brilliant. The fifth thing is, is, is stopping you from, I forget what the fifth thing was, but it was one thing that I was doing that was blocking the result. So it was, it was, the fifth thing was something you were doing to practice, but she's like, that's actually not helping. Is that what the point was? Yes, yeah. absolutely. You know, just as at the beginning stages, if we're learning something from the beginning and we try and play too quickly too soon, that yeah. blocks the speed and fluency. But there's a time when, you know, slow practice can also be a block. Mm. I mean, if, we, if we've done our slow practice and we're now building up reflexes for speed, um, lightness or whatever, and if we go back to slow, heavy, firm practice, uh, which is very, very useful for a lot of things, but... Uh, at that particular stage could could actually be an impediment. Mm, I see, yeah. I was telling her I was practicing it slowly and firmly that bit, and, and she would have picked up, well, yes, that if you're doing it, if you're practicing it slowly and firmly at, at this stage of the game, you're after speed and lightness, then that's an impediment at that particular point. Mm, mm. It's, it's such an art, and I guess that's what we're going to unpack uh, today. Um, I, I just want to backtrack slightly because we've, I think we've already covered two kind of really good points about us as teachers, what we've got to do. And the first one you said was asking your students to articulate how they practice something and not accepting, I did it slowly, even if they could do that. I think if I asked half my students, they'd go, I don't know, I started at the beginning, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is really unfortunate because they know exactly how I want them to practice. But do you think we could kind of put that down as number one uh, top thing to do? Absolutely. I, I, if we're explaining practice methods to the students and we're not asking them to demonstrate them back to us, then we're, how can we expect them to do it? So if I, if I, let's say I, I want one of my students to, to practice slowly, I can hear that they've not done enough slow practice. Or let's say it's separate practice. I mean, so often the left hand is just covered up by what the right hand's doing because we're listening to the right hand. So I'll get them to sit on their right hand. And I'll, <laughs> I'll ask them to, to show me. And it's not just this is what you do when you practice. Show me. I'd like to hear it. I'd like to see this. Mm. So I tend mm. to get them to, to show me as part of next lesson what they've been practicing. Um, and how, I mean, there's one thing. Oh, well, absolutely. Yeah. I totally have. I yeah. always will, will yeah. illustrate it. Because I have found kind of universally, I'm sure you've had the same term. You, you, you ask somebody, uh, they know they're supposed to practice slowly, and you say, well, let me hear your slow practice speed. <laughs> it just isn't. It isn't slow. It uh, maybe starts a tiny bit slower, but then by the third or fourth bar, it's back up to where it was. So I, I sort of formulated this. Um, precision about that. Okay, I'd like to hear it half the speed, please, or a quarter of the speed. And that means find your pulse, what the, the speed that you envisage this music at, or the speed that we've decided, and halve it, or quarter it. Mm. So they, they, they're then thinking that a quaver uh, or an eighth note for, um, I don't know what you use in, in Australia, do you say quavers and crotchets, or do you say it's, uh, Yeah, okay, so um, you know, a, a crotchet would then become a minim in your imagination, or, or a, mm -hmm. if you're doing it at quarter speed, a crotchet will become a semi brief That gives you an awful lot of uh, thinking space in the long note. So during the long notes in the slow work, the brain is firing very fast. It's not slow and slow. It's slow yet very quick. Mm. I think that's mm. the thing. That, that there's a lot going on in the slow practice. Mm. So I think we're kind of refining, you know, a, a second point about this for teachers. It's uh, if you would like students to practice something slowly, then at the next lesson, ask them to demonstrate it and make yes. sure they are practicing it slowly. And if they're not, then I guess a metronome is probably, I mean, it's, an un you know, it's kind of robotic and mechanical, but if that's what they need to make sure they're playing slowly, perhaps, would you recommend that? I, I, yeah, so, you know, if, uh, okay. 
I have a metronome, it sits here. I think I've never once changed the battery on this thing, and I've had it years. It shows how much I use it. Uh, I personally don't like the idea of students sitting with a metronome, only because I think they just go on autopilot, they're not listening to what they're doing, and actually, in the end, music is never, and you could put on a recording of the greatest pianist playing what you would think of as being the, the most strict piece. I mean, if you think of this... And example, you'd have thought, well, that has to be probably one of the most metronomic pieces that I know. Well, if you listen mm -hmm. to a great pianist play that piece and you've somehow found what their metronome speed is and you put the metronome on with them, within a bar or two, the metronome would be out. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I find the thing with the metronome is use it a little bit, but, but don't... Um, I, I personally don't recommend too much metronome practice because then practice just becomes mindless. Yeah, sure. And you just, yeah. uh, listening goes out of the window. And you want to just people... Sorry. No, no, we've got this time lag on, on this thing. Uh, you know, I want people to be engaged rhythmically and, and, and a metronome isn't rhythmical. It's just, just screams out of the beats, doesn't it? It says one, one. One, one, or one, two, three, four. If you've got one of the fancy ones with different tones on the mm. the beat, still um, not really how music works. So I, I mean, I, I use it, but, but limit, I don't like it too much. Mm. No, that's <laughs> good. I, I appreciate your uh, you know your thoughts on it. It's good. Counting out is a very very good thing. You know, if you've got a, a beginner who's not playing in time, have them count. You know, if if they can conduct or you know, let's say they're playing something like this. One, two, three, one, two, three, one. And I can even reflect the quality of downbeat in my one, mm. two, and lightness in two, three. <clears throat> so, you know, counting, I find, counting out aloud is one of the things that Leon Fleischer got us to do. Um, I had classes with Leon Fleischer, who is probably one of the great piano gurus in the world. Mm, sure. um, Oh, they, they were amazing classes, but one of the things he, he regularly returned to was count out aloud as you practice. Yeah, yep. even for uh, sort of intermediate and advanced level students. Absolutely. I find, for me, if, if, if I'm uh, wanting to, to add a little element, because it takes up brain space, you see, if you count, doesn't it? I mean, if you think about it, you're... A lot of it, yeah. <laughs> and so if you've got your bandwidth is being um, expanded, so when you stop counting, not only do you know where all the strong beats are, um, you know uh, you, you can do the playing, the automated part of the playing is possible even when your brain is involved in counting. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. It's, it's it you time and, and it, it frees up a lot of space at the end when you stop counting. When you stop counting, I was going to say, but uh, students do find it very difficult, uh, which is why I like to impress on it right at the beginning, you know, right from this, those first lessons. If, if students can't count, well, can't one, feel a pulse before they start playing, yeah. uh, and two, count as they play, I, I think we, we lose a lot of the ability to sense rhythm and feel downbeats, as you say. Uh, so I'm a big advocate for the same thing. Absolutely. Um, now, one other thing you mentioned a little bit earlier, I just want to go back to, was tension. Uh, so here's another, perhaps, a tip for, for teachers. Uh, I think your words were something to the effect of, you know, depending on how you approach a student in a lesson, verbally and physically, that sort of thing, you can actually, you know, prevent them from playing and practicing, perhaps, well. Can you just uh, talk to that just for a moment? If, uh, if at the end of the, the student's playing, the teacher is just going to focus on what was wrong, um, thinking they're doing a service, you know, I'm telling you all the things that are wrong so you can go away and improve those things and write them down in the book and go over them in the lesson. What happens then is that, that you're approaching, or the teacher would be approaching that from a negative point of view. So uh, the pupil is more likely to be focused on what they're doing that's not pleasing the teacher or that's not working or that's not right, mm -hmm. rather than balancing the observations and starting off with some, you can always find something constructive to say, even if it's, wow, you managed to get through that piece, that's, that's great, you managed to get from the beginning to the end. Or you could say something like, that's beginning to sound really close to, to where we're aiming for. I mean, in other words, that's a word of encouragement that makes the pupil feel good about what they've just done. Um, and then introducing the, the criticism and not in, not in any kind of cold or cruel way. Because I do think that, that this Victorian attitude that 
we've all probably some inherited to some extent or other about some, you know, I mean, I can, I can remember speaking to somebody who had a, a teacher who said to them when they were growing up, uh, who never, never gave any positive criticism at all, never gave any encouragement at all, and one particular lesson said to them, um, yes, you're playing that much better. And of course, the, the people almost fell off the seat because they'd never had uh, encouragement. And then, then she added, but, but mind you, so, so you should after the number of lessons you've had on it. Okay. You know, so it, it, it has to come from the teacher being on the side of the pupil rather than an, as an adversary. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Like, uh, how silly of you not to remember that. No, it's got to come from now. Are we going to see if we can make this scale passage or this, this run in this sonata just a little bit more even and just a little bit more shapely? How do you think, how do you think it would sound if we just gave that a little bit more control? Mm. Um, and if mm. the pupils on your side, they say, oh, yeah, I'd like to be able to do that. Then you show them how to do that and you empower them. Whereas if at the end of that experience you say, yes, of course that run is very uneven and very stiff and tight, uh, you've, made the, you've made a negative uh, a connection with that. Mm. So, mm. you know, and, and that get, brings, brings about things like shaming. And a lot, of, a lot of teachers inadvertently shame their pupils. You know, they make it, make it feel like uh, you should have known that or you should have been able to do that. The fact is they didn't do it and they didn't know it. So then you tell them. Mm. And you empathize. <laughs> and I'd put that back. You know, I'd put that back on myself and go, "Well, they didn't know it because I haven't taught it very well." But I guess that's perhaps not not something that all, all teachers think. But yeah, I, I hope less of that's going on these days in piano lessons. I, I, I think it is, but it's it's still something that you know I, I I would always observe when I do my observation, teaching observation, very very hot on that because um, you know it's it's nobody needs it. Nobody needs to be shamed. Nobody needs to be disempowered. It's our business to do the opposite, yep. to inspire yep. and instruct and um, to, to make a piano lesson a beautiful experience. I mean, I think a piano lesson should be a wonderful, wonderful experience for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's not much fun being a grumpy old teacher anyway, is it? I mean, let's face it. <laughs> I have much more fun being fun. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. Well, let's start talking uh, a little bit about more specifics then. So as teachers, as I said right at the beginning, you know, one of those frustrating things is you show them, you know, okay, you've got to count in this section. You need to start at the end or, you know, play this block. You need to do it X number of times. You should try it with the metronome or not or whatever it is. The student comes back and... You ask them what, they, what they've done to practice, and those things just haven't seemed to sunk, to sink in. So, I wonder if you could take us through you know, some of your kind of your, your big recommendations for teachers about about ways to teach practicing that really you found really work, and hopefully the students take on board. Okay, I mean, I think nitty gritty practicing, you know, about how you solve problems at the, at the piano during the practice. Um, that's that's one thing that we. I'd like to get into, but, but maybe I could just start off with something quite general that just applies to everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. the, 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 the principle of, um, you know, if you're playing through your piece, you'll have certain sections of it that could be weak links. You know, it could be bar six, where the left hand just sort of doesn't really quite know where it's going, or on the next page, uh, just some connect, some hand shift so that the hands move from here, whatever it may be. And, and so I've come to, you know, with my students now, we, we do this thing called quarantine. Right. So we identify right. the weak links and we mark these on the score. Now, I teach all ages and all levels. I teach an awful lot of professional pianists. But I also love to teach youngsters. So I've got a certain number of youngsters who come and they know what quarantine is. I draw a little square bracket around the, around the, the, the bars and they know that they start exactly at the note where the square bracket comes and they finish exactly where the square bracket ends. So they don't start a bit before and they don't go on afterwards. They literally isolate that one spot, maybe three or four quarantine spots in any given piece. And what we do is we work on those in the lesson, we solve the problem, I show them what they need to do to practice. Then the next week, when they come back, <clears throat> they know the rule, they have to play those quarantine spots before they're allowed to play the piece. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if they haven't actually done that, it's very obvious from the beginning that they haven't done it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so what will happen is that they actually won't be able to play those quarantine spots. So they know the rule. If they can't manage the quarantine spots, then they're not allowed to play the piece. <laughs> Simple as that. We, we close that piece and say, we'll move on now to something else. 
Right. And that well, makes... I, was, I was going to ask, do you, yeah, do you then work with them on it if they, if they need it, I assume, but otherwise you just go, no, nah, we'll, we'll go on to something else? I, what I do is, you know, people's lives are busy. They do lots of other things. They're not just doing piano. So, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt for the first week. Maybe they just forgot, even though it would be written down for them in their instructions, but maybe they just didn't get to it or they didn't get to it enough or they weren't serious enough about it. So we'll work on those spots again, three or four spots. Um, and then, then it's over to them. And if the next week they still haven't done it, then, then a little bit of discipline is good. Yeah. I mean, a discipline yeah. is absolutely essential to, to all of us when we practice, isn't it? I mean, we can't master any instrument, let alone one as complex as the piano, without incredible discipline. And I think that has to come from the teacher, too. Mm. Um, mm. Discipline with, with, you know, like um, constructive discipline. <laughs> so, you know, if after two or three weeks they still haven't done that, close the book and say, we're going to move on to something else. What have you practiced, you know? Yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Well, okay, so uh, step one, I like this idea of quarantine. I've never used that word before, but I, I get it. I think it's, it's good, and I can imagine that the analogy works for students too. Yeah, it's a good start. Um, you, yeah. were, you were going to say something else too about the next, the next thing, I think. Uh, no, that's, that's, that slipped from my, my mind there. That's um, okay. I, that's I, right. I, was just, I think the thing with the quarantine is I was just going to say, you know, once they've mastered that particular block, you just erase the marks. You just just rub out the the, the pencil brackets, and and uh, I mean I find that I use that for myself a lot in my own practice. The other day I played through my Schumann Sonata, and I noticed a little place in the scherzo that didn't feel particularly comfortable. So of course, what did I do? The next time I practiced, I went straight to that spot mm. and just yeah. just, just went and took my tempo right down to grassroots level and separated my hands so I could see exactly what the left hand was doing in that place. And that, you know, it, it's what we all do. What's what we all should do. Um, it just strengthen the weak spots first before we do anything else. Otherwise, those spots are always going to remain weak links. And, a, and a, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, isn't it? If you think about it, if, you, if you've got a chain and you pull on it, it's going to snap at the point of least resistance and, and for me uh, pulling on a chain is you know the pulling part of, uh, of this is nerves it could be a, in an exam where you, you've got a sense of occasion so you're a little nervous things are going to break at the point of least mm. resistance so that's why I'm all about strengthening the these links the weak parts, the weak parts yeah. Strengthen the first, yes. I think it's great to hear a professional concert pianist too talk about slow practice because I think a lot of us, and particularly students, you know, see these amazing people on YouTube doing the most, you know, fingers everywhere. It's all incredible, and but they don't see that slow, careful, yep. methodical practice, quarantining, all that kind of stuff that goes on, uh, and it's it's often hard to make that connection for them. Yes, and I, that's actually really true. Now I always bring it back to the Rachmaninoff story that I, I really like to tell. It's in, I've, I've written about it, it's in my book, it's on my blog. The, the, the great uh, piano writer Abram Chasens, who wrote this fantastic book, Speaking of Pianists. It's, it's, you know, it's an old book, he's, he's passed away a long, a, a long time ago, but he had a lesson with Rachmaninoff, can you believe, somebody actually writing about a piano lesson with the great <laughs> Rachmaninoff. And he went, yes, <laughs> he, he went up to Rachmaninoff's cottage in, in Hollywood, I think it was, and, you know, he was standing outside the door, about to press the buzzer, but he could hear somebody, Rachmaninoff, inside the house practicing something. He didn't recognize what it was because it was so slow. Uh, the practice was so slow. Now, it happened to be the etude in thirds, the Chopin third study. Now, Rachmaninoff hadn't, wasn't just learning this piece. He was keeping it fresh. In other words, he was maintaining it by practicing it at such a speed that even a colleague didn't recognize what the music was, and it's a famous piece of music. I mean, we're talking about yeah. snail's pace, and you're absolutely right, Tim. You know, when people look at, look at what a pianist does, it looks like, you know, their, their eyes are in some sort of ecstatic place, and they're looking for inspiration to the rafters, where and all of that work has been done in the practicing. And, and, and uh, yes, I, and that, I think when I tell a student that even a great world-class concert pianist needed to practice a piece he already knew so slowly that a colleague <laughs> then they sort of take it on board that maybe it's good for me too you know? mm. 
Yeah. And I um, I wrote an article not long ago. I, I had a reference to, I don't know if you, you're aware, but I certainly wasn't aware that uh, Formula One drivers and race car drivers, uh, before they race on a track, will walk the track. Uh, oh. And I use this analogy. So they actually get out and they walk the entire track and they see every tiny bend, curve, bump in the road, all that kind of stuff at that speed. And then then they fly along at a 200 kilometers an hour and i love this analogy particularly for the boys i teach it's like you know if they're doing that then the, yeah. it, it relates perfectly to what we have to do yes absolutely now i'm wondering too i've, I've got some as we've been talking i've been thinking you know what i want, actually want to ask you some questions about some specific things that I, I imagine a lot of teachers have trouble with with regard to their students and whether you've got some tips about how to fix those things through practice so the first one I was thinking of is uneven passage work, which yes. comes up all the time. So have you got some practice tips that teachers can share with their students that, that you found really work for evening up uneven passage work? Right, okay, well, first of all, I, I, you know, you've got to identify why the passage is uneven. Is it because the thumb isn't moving? Is it because the wrist is stiff? Or is it because they've just been sloppy and not really figured out a fingering? Um, or have they just not done their slow practice? So, yeah, passage work. Um, you know, there's this old traditional way of doing it, which is practicing in, in different rhythms. Now, I don't know whether you mm -hmm. use different rhythms. I do. I, I think, yeah, I, I, I will use them, but we'll use them um, cautiously because, again, that's another thing where, you know, you can, you can say, oh yes, I've, I've spent the last hour practicing that passage in all the different rhythms, therefore I must have really pra been practicing fantastically. Um, it's like anything else. You, if you practice them well, they can really serve you. If you don't practice them well, they can waste your time and tighten you up. And, you know, there's always a shadow side to everything. But coming back to that question, um, to be able to play and listen to every sound that you're making, because there's two ways you can be uneven. You can be uneven in time, in other words, you know, there would be some parts of the passage that would be faster than other parts, and yet the tempo is supposed to be the same. Or you could be uneven in tone, where you've got accents. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the first thing is, in order to correct something, you've got to bring the pupil's awareness. Uh, they've got to be able to identify whether it's even or uneven. And this is the thing, you know, they, they often practice at home, but they don't, they don't know how, how they've done because they need to be yeah. they need to be shown how to how to be hyper vigilant and I mean I do this thing I, I, I call it the quality control inspector where you know like on a, a, a factory production line you've got these guys in white coats and hair nets in a food factory anyway mm. and they you got these biscuits that come out Let, let's let's call them custard creams I don't know if you have custard creams in Australia but there's this well, okay, so if you imagine you've got all these custard creams coming out of this uh, this thing, let's say they represent semi-quavers in a passage, and, and they come out and one of them's a little, a little bit chipped at the corner, um, or one of them is broken in the middle, or one of them is upside down, whatever it may be, you've got a quality control inspector in your factory who just whips them off the production line and throws them out. Now, I think you can awaken that quality control, control inspector in your student by simply asking them, and this is what I do, I ask them at the end, um, let's say, let's go back to your question about the passage. So how do, how do you think that, how do you think that passage was? Oh, give yourself a mark out of 10 for that. And let's say they say, yeah, seven. Um, I found that they're usually very, very good. They get the same mark as I'd give. And then I'd say, okay, okay seven, that's brilliant. So you're obviously, um, you've got seven. Where did the extra three marks go? And they'll say, yeah, well, I noticed that it was, it was uh, uneven, just around that part. So, they, you know, you can just encourage them to, to be their own um, quality control inspector at home when they're practicing. Now, that's the first part of it. They've got to be aware of the fact that they were playing unevenly. Now, are, are you talking about technical control? Are you talking about the ability to be digitally accurate at speed? Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm thinking of a student that I've, I've taught recently. He's, he's a re he's, uh, probably doesn't practice as much as he should or as slowly as he should, but you know, just a five-finger kind of pattern that's reasonably fast is just kind of lumpy, and he's got the right fingering, he's got the right notes, all that kind of stuff. But, uh, yeah, it's just, just untidy. And so I just wondered, you know, what's your go-to kind of thing for practicing apart from slow the thing with slow is that 
I always qualify slow. It's slow yet fast. So if I show you what I mean, and I'll come back to the passage thing in a minute, because that could be any, any one of a, a whole variety of different issues. I mean, if, 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 if let's say you've got a five-finger position and they're doing this. See what I'm doing there? I'm locking my wrist and I'm digitizing it. I'm making everything. Mm -hmm. Now, it could just be a simple question uh, of, of getting the wrist. See what I've done there now? I've added a little bit of lateral freedom into the wrist to the fingers. And that, I mean, I can, I can compare the difference in sensation. This feels quite effortful to me to do that with just my fingers. But as soon as I add, that is 100 times easier to manage. So it, it could just be that. Um, you know, it could be something technical, which would be, could vary from, Student to student, but if I, if the, you know, the slow practice idea there would be, play the key fast, in other words, strongly, and then immediately switch off the effort so that you're not pressing into the key. This is what I often find. Key bedding. It's what uh, Tobias Mate ended up calling it. Key bedding. It's unnecessary pressure at the bottom of the key after you've sounded the, the, the note. So if we go back to our slow speed, let's say. Um, what note values were those that you, you were talking about? Are they uh, semi quests? They were quavers, actually. All right, let's say we're going to do it quarter speed. So now we've got minims. So on the first quaver part of each minim, or even the first crotchet part of each minim, we're going to think about the attack. On the second beat, we're thinking about the release. So now I'm completely loose in my arm. The finger's not digging. So what I've got is one, two, relax. Effort, release. Effort, release. And if I do that slowly enough, let's say I'm taking this contraption. You know, that Mozart Tonata. Mm -hmm. If I do that at this speed. Effort, release. Effort, release. Effort, release. You see what I'm doing? Yep. There's yep. a conscious moment at the, after every single finger stroke where I'm commanding my body to release. Not relax, because if I relax... I fall off the key. But come to that point where everything is beautifully balanced on that finger. That is just like almost weightlessness. It's like a, a puppeteer who's got the puppet, and the puppet is just, uh, you know, suspended. So I'm now suspended. And if I do that with my pupils, I show them that process. Effort, release of effort. That could, well, often will completely change that because they're building that moment of release into the reflex arc. So that means uh, that gets programmed into the motor cortex. Mm. And it eventually it's, becomes um, you know, second nature. They don't have to think about it. It, it actually is an ingredient of, of what happens in the final product. Mm. So effortlessly, but it happens so fast that you don't perceive it. All you perceive is, wow, my fingers are really... Uh, you know, everything feels smooth and easy today. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the other thing with the slow practice, you know, that I've got one, one person at the moment, a little one, uh, eight-year-old, doing the uh, Rodeca Capriccioso, Mendelssohn. Now, I've got her to do that, and she does this beautifully. If I just show you um, the slow, you, I think hopefully those of you who can see this and are not listening on the podcast will see that when I release the key here, I move like lightning to the next. You see what's happening? Mm. As soon as I release this position, my hand is now covered. So all the movements are just as fast as they would be, if not faster, actually. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, they're, they're very fast. Uh, definitely, this is a chance uh, for people to watch watch this section. <laughs> really interesting. Yeah, and, and you can do that for anything that moves around. Let's say you've got what was I working with the other day? Something where the where the where the hands have to move quickly. So you you know you can the tempo can be slow, but all of the movements, the shifts in positions, are really fast. If I can, am I talking too much? No, go for it. I like it. It's good. <laughs> you know, I, going back to one of those lessons I had with Philip Folk when I was a youngster, he he got me to to study the Rachmaninoff C sharp minor prelude, which I'm sure everybody. I was actually no. just, just thinking about that. When I, I was thinking, I'd love to ask you about leaps, and I think that might be what you're getting to. Well, leap, I could spend an hour and a half talking about leaps, but I won't. No, don't. But just, just, 
Okay. So I practice, but let me let me use my pedal to show you. So the, the last section I'm going to practice slowly and yet fast. So all the distances. You see what's happening here? All the distances are covered super fast. You know, mm. everything is, is, is slow in, in the tempo, but the movements are fast. And this is, this is the thing. So we're practicing slowly in order to um, build in reflexes for speed mm. eventually. Yeah, so I think you're getting, you're getting at the difference between slow practice and practice that is in time slow, but the movements are still quick. I, I understand what you're saying. It's, it's a bit hard to explain, but you demonstrated that well, I thought. Um, I, I'm interested too, just moving on to a, a different topic. Uh, I'm having a look through uh, your um, uh, the download that you're offering to people. Uh, and you talk oh, yeah. about a couple of things there, which, which, are, which are great. And one of them you talk about is the three S's. And yes. I wonder if you could uh, talk about this, because this is, I think, a great kind of thing for teachers to keep in mind. Yeah, three S's. It's it's trademark, you know. Um, <laughs> Patented. Uh, yes, I, I formulated this many years ago. It's just you know how a little bit of jargon can sometimes help. It saves you having to reinvent the, the wheel each time. So if you say to the, the mm. student, "Yes, you need a good dose of the three S's this week," um, they know or they they've got to go down to, to to elementary detail again. So slowly, separately, sections. That's all the three S's are. So. Slowly, I think we've covered an, enough on mm -hmm. slow mm -hmm. practice, you know, for now. Maybe we'll come back to it. Separate practice. You know, the thing is with separate, it's not just a question of separate hands. Um, because music moves in lines so often, doesn't it? I'm not talking just about strict, you know, Bach fugues or anything. If you look at, let me take this popular piece that people like to play, and for good reason. You know, you're better to have empathy, slow movement. What you've got there is three strands. So let's say you know, let's say you've got a violin on the top, a viola, and a cello at the bottom. And if I practice my right hand separately, what I what I've got going there is I'm actually practicing my violin and my viola together, right? So that's separate, separate hands. Supposing I wanted to practice my violin and my cello together, I'd still be using both hands, but I'm practicing. Strands. Mm. See where I'm coming from. So I would do this. I'd miss out perhaps my middle viola line, so that I can better perceive what's going on, you know, on the outer line. Then I find all sorts of interesting things. I notice that you know the cello line rises up a fourth, and then ah, oh, so does my violin. Yeah. Then that falls down a second. Ah, oh, so does that. Now we're going in opposite directions, contrary motion. So you, you start to engage. Uh, mm -hmm. This is what this is one of the things I think is so important. It's engaging the the mind, observing the patterns that, that happen in the music, so that it takes out of just muscle memory. Because after a while, muscle memory is you know it's, it's one of those things that's our best friend when we're at home. But when we get nervous, uh, it's our worst enemy. It just deserts us. Mm. So I'm a great believer in, in when we're doing all of these, these, the, all this practicing is just to, to be alert to what the music is doing at any given moment. So that that would be strands separately. Let's say I would do now my bass line, my cello line with my viola, uh, omitting the violin. What I can do now is really listen to my left hand and shape that line, shape it beautifully, and keep my viola just soft, you know? So that I, I'm attending to my tonal balance uh, when I practice. So again, just keeping the end product in mind, not mechanically moving the fingers. Mm. So that would be, that would be separately. Um, so, uh, what was the other thing? Sections, yes. Yeah, sections. sections. This, this is one of the most important things, I think. Uh, the working memory is, is, is a little bit like, uh, you know, the short-term memory or the working memory can only contain a certain amount of information at any one moment um, before you... If you think of the, the house of cards, you know, where you build a, you build a house with, with playing cards, you put the extra one on and the whole lot, it collapses, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or the straw that breaks the camel back. So let's say you're, you're practicing a section of music and you start at the beginning and you play through to the end. 
By the time you've got to the end of the first line or maybe the second line, you, your brain forgets that and is now engaged with, it's, it's a little bit like peripheral vision. You can see what you can see and you can see in your peripheral vision, but beyond that you can't see. So what I'm interested in with the sections is to take a section that you can hold or contain as, as one unit. So if you're working on, on a small enough section, by the time you get to the end of that section, you're still able to feel what you did at the beginning and in the middle. And you can work with that. Uh, so if, if the section's too long, you don't retain any of it. I, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure your viewers, Tim, will, will, will uh, um, remember this or have experience of this, where you have a practice session, and by the end of the practice session, and you've played it through, let's say, a number of times, you can really, you feel, yeah, that's coming along great. That's now start, starting to sound wonderful. It's feeling good. And, yeah, I've really practiced. And then the next day they come to it, and it's like as though that nothing had happened. You get into a flow state, sure, but you don't retain anything. So for me, the, 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 the principle of retaining um, what we do in our practice has to come down to working with our working memory or the short-term memory, not trying to do too big of a section at a time. Right. That's why right. like bar by bar practice is the, one of the most wonderful things to do, you know. One bar and one note, stop. <laughs> yeah, yes. I like my, getting my students to do that. Uh, that's, it's an, an interesting uh, thing, because so, I thought you were going to talk about sections, you know, we just have to practice in sections, we all know that anyway. But So you're saying uh, it's about uh, making sure your practice remains conscious uh, yes. by... Yes by having knowledge of these sections and where you're actually at in the piece, rather than it just being a, a, this kind of flow state, as you say. That's an interesting um, recommendation. I like it. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think otherwise what will happen is you might have a good practice and retain, or you might not. And you want to really maximize the effectiveness of every single minute you spend practicing. I think that, yeah, it's, it's really important to be conscious in the practicing, to listen, to be mm. aware of not, not just the sounds that are coming out, but to be aware of our body. I mean, playing the piano is an incredibly physical process. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've got to be aware of our body, we've got to be aware of our breathing, how it feels, um, how it's sounding, is this correct? Is it uh, good quality sound? You know, all these things. Mm. I find uh, young students, uh, I teach a lot of teenagers, and particularly teenage beginners or very early, kind of intermediate, uh, I'll sometimes ask them when they've finished playing something, well, you know, as you do, uh, how did that sound? <laughs> and they'll, they'll go, uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Some of them actually won't have been listening. I'm like, why, why aren't you listening to what you're doing? Um, maybe this is just me and the students I have, but um, sometimes, yeah, you really have to, to get them to switch on to actually actively listen to what they're doing and not just, you know, hear it washing, you know, in one ear and out the other. Um, and I, I sometimes get them to video themselves or I'll actually see I kind of secretly while they're performing something in the lesson I'll just record it and say here uh -huh. you go have a, have a look do you have any uh, any tips for that perhaps it's it's something that my, my kids have more than others I'm not sure I think that's a very very good idea recording them and, and recording our own practice and yeah I think that's a that's a brilliant brilliant idea um, yes I think the only thing I, I, I could add to that would be in, it's, it's what I call my flow chart. It's, um, I don't know if I can describe it. I don't have it easily to hand. But you can train them to actually tell you what it was or tell themselves what it was that they liked and what it was that they didn't like about their performance. Just with a bit of probing in a, in a lesson, I find you can ask them questions. Mm -hmm. how, how do you think you did here? How was your pedaling there? Do you think your pedaling en enhanced the sound there? Or do you think you kept it down a little too long for this? Or was it too deep? Whatever. And after a while, you kind of get them to to um, to know whether what, what they're doing is, is on target. But I do think, I, I often will ask them at the end of the performance, I, rather than me just give my spiel, I'll just say, now, how, how do you think you did? And, and uh, to tell, me, tell me what you thought worked well in your play. I always like to start with that. Tell, mm. tell me what you think about what you did. Uh, tell me what you think you could do better. And tell me what you're confused about, you know? Is that, if they could play their pieces flawlessly they wouldn't need to come for a lesson so yeah, <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of the asking questions thing and I actually wrote a blog blog post about uh, the effect of asking more questions in lessons and what, what that had on my students and I, I almost kind of just said to myself one day I'm only going to ask questions this lesson 
yeah, can't ban brilliant. myself from saying anything. I've got to just draw it out of the students. And it's, an ama- it's amazing what effect it has because it really forces them to listen. And if they didn't know the answer, I got them to play it again and listen and then ask the question. Oh, uh, yeah, I think that's... You know, I, it comes from a different part of the brain. If you played something and you're just sitting there, you're, you're about to practice, you're, you're engaging in, say, one part of your brain. If you'd, All you'd have to do would be to stop and reflect. And reflecting could be... Let's say you write down what it is you need to do in the practice. Let's say you've got a practice diary and you, you've played and maybe you've recorded your playing and you've listened back. Just jot down a few notes. It could even be bar by bar uh, or page by page what you need to do because that's engaging another part of your brain um, from that part that's just sitting there using ears. Mm. <laughs> so, and I'll mm. sometimes, when I'm, I'm practicing, I sometimes just talk out loud to myself. Uh, oh, you know, I just want to admit that, Graham. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, I can actually give myself instructions like relax, uh, just chill here, whatever it may be. Or I could just, I could just say, you need more, more left hand there, whatever it is. Just coach that can. Everybody's got their own inner coach. Mm. If it, it just needs to be woken up, it just needs to be engaged with. And I, I just find reflection is one of the strongest cards that we've got. You know, we can all reflect on what we've done, and and write down what it is we need to do. Be our own to put, let, we, we need to put ourselves out of business by encouraging our students to be their own teachers. And they, often they, they will. If you, just with a, give them a little bit of encouragement and permission, they can tell, tell themselves an awful lot more than we give them credit for about what, you know, what it is that's good, what it is that's not working. They know. <laughs> Even in little ones. <laughs> I, think, I think it's actually a really good, uh, it's kind of a place to almost end where we've got to wrap up. I can't believe how quickly the time's gone. I could talk about this for, for a long time, but thankfully you've written down a lot of this stuff um, in your ebook. So I wondered if you could just kind of explain who they're for and, and how, how, they, how they work. Thanks, Jim, yes. Now, the ebooks are um, not, well, how do I describe this? They've got, they contain videos, they contain printouts, they're not just like a print book where you read the stuff. They're interactive. Yes. That's the word. Of Multimedia, that's the word. Um, well, they're in four volumes. I've got the first volume that, that talks about the practice tools. So that's what we've been talking about uh, throughout is if you think of the practice tools as a toolbox full of um, individual specific tools. So that's, that, that's the first volume, um, first part, I should say. Each part is in several volumes. Then I, do a, I did another one on, on performance, what needs to happen in performance, mm-hmm. uh, to prepare for a performance. Uh, and, that, and that's memorization, that's, that's run-throughs, that's all the sort of, um, you know, technology related to performance. Uh, another one on scales and arpeggios, There's hundreds of ways to practice scales and arpeggios so that we're just always engaged. And then another volume, another, I have to get clear on volumes, it's a part. <laughs> A part that contains several volumes um, on technique. So you know, with with video demonstrations, and uh, you you can just keep replaying the videos until you can see what it is that's going on. Um, they yes, they they're very popular these these ebooks, and I'm actually quite proud of them. I don't think there's that much written about practicing. There's a lot written on technique, and it just depends on which particular brand of kind of religion you come from. Mm. So you come from the Russians, you come from the French, you know, whatever, whether you use a lot of fingers or whether you use arm weight or rotation. Technique is, is one thing, but practicing should apply to everybody. You know, to, so that's why I wrote the books in the first place, because I wanted to address practicing per se. Practicing specifically. Practicing specifically. Yes, yes. And, yes. and one yes. of those volumes of Practicing the Piano, which is the name of the ebook, is about technique. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. Second so technique, point. there's scales and arpeggios, there's performing and the toolbox of practice. Yes. Yep. Yes. Brilliant. Brilliant. And look, I, I, I'm not an affiliate for you or anything like that. I just believe strongly in your product. I, I, I've seen the, the books and I refer to them. They're great. You can access them on your iPad, your laptop, whatever it is. Um, so I do recommend um, people go and have a look. If you found this discussion interesting, uh, there's just so much more we could unpack, but unfortunately, <laughs> there just isn't the time. Um, before we kind of start wrapping up, is there any anything else that you're just like, oh, I really, I, I just got to say this one thing or, or anything like that? Maybe there's not. I'm not sure. Well, not specifically, but I do think what we've got to try and do for ourselves and for our students is to just encourage the love of music because that's really at the bottom of it. It's not 
how we can impress our friends playing fast and loud. It's it's what music does in, in our life, how music enriches our lives. And for me, I, I think I've never lost that passion for music. And that's one of the things I try to do always in my teaching is to just always come back to that. Why are we doing this? It's because music is so transcendental, really. I mean, it doesn't matter what's going on in the world and there's some horrible things going on in the world. We'll always have that space, that heavenly space where music exists in our lives. And that's worth uh, working for. And um, that's at the bottom of it all. <laughs> that's what yeah. I can say. Yeah. What, what a great, yeah, great sort of undercurrent. And, and yeah, that's why we do it, isn't it? Let's face it. That's why I, te I teach to share. I, I you know, do these podcasts to share ideas so that more students can can have that love and and have you know exciting innovative lessons and things so yeah i'm with, i'm with you there <laughs> all right so now where can people find you uh online graham right well my my, my blog is www.practicingthepiano.com um so that you can read my blog and there's a lot of free content you can actually not buy my ebooks and still read hundreds of blog posts which will give you a complete picture of in individual aspects. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, one place. post a week. You do? Is that right? I do. Yes, I try, I try. In summer, I still do one post a week, but but they're slightly different in the summer because I need a little bit of time, uh, just where I'm not always thinking about uh, piano practice. The other place um, you can find my work is on the Pianist Magazine YouTube channel, mm -hmm. where I got. I forget how many we've got now. Probably about twenty or so. Uh, video demonstrations at Steinway Hall in London where I'm going through specific aspects of piano practice, piano technique, piano playing. So th those are the main places. Fantastic. And uh, do you offer Skype lessons by any chance? Or just you know, other ones? I, I, well, I've got a, I'm busy enough that I don't need to think hmm. about Skype lessons, but I have had a couple of requests and um, I'm open to the idea. I'm, I'm open to the idea of a Skype lesson. I'm just a bit unfamiliar with it, so I wouldn't know how that felt to do. I, I wouldn't know could I really listen well. Yeah, um, but I'm open to the to the okay. idea. Of well, we've done this one on Skype, so uh, you've 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 put a foot in the door, I guess. <laughs> um, and look, I'll put a link on the show notes page to uh, the special offer we've got on your ebook. So uh, you've very kindly offered twenty percent off any of the publications or a bundle of them, which is fantastic, so thank you. I'll put a link in the show notes to how um, people can get that and the code that they can use. Um, and as a reminder, notes from this, um, this episode are gonna be at timtobham.com forward slash episode 11. So Graham, look, I think we'll wrap it up there. It's been so good to talk with you again. It was probably, well, it must have been three years ago you were in Melbourne that we actually first met, first face to face. You're out doing some master classes and then performing yeah, sort of. That's right. I played Goldberg variations in on Australia in that's three right. different classes. Yes, love, I've been to Australia many times. I love it. Yeah. So look, we'll I'd love to have you over at some stage. But uh, this has been a great chance to catch up. I really appreciate your time and all sharing all your expertise. So, uh, and I might uh, just pop um, a message to to anyone that's listening. If you want to ask a question about practice, uh, leave it on the show notes page. Uh, I'll try my best to to give you some some pointers. But I might shoot you an email if uh, if I get stuck, and you can perhaps. Uh, give people a quick helping hand or just refer to you've probably written about most things that people ask I imagine so we could refer them to your blog perhaps Happily, yes, that's great. Yeah, thank that's you so great. much you're really welcome thank you Graham I'll, uh, I'll sign off and um, we'll see everyone in uh, episode 12 thanks guys and thanks Graham see pleasure you. bye